as I looked, as I looked thrones, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. The court was seated, and the books were opened. And the books were opened. Did you know that there's a courtroom in heaven? The Bible is so filled with imagery of courts and courtrooms and judges and testimonies. And I don't believe that this is an accident. I believe that there is a heavenly court system and that not only are we encouraged to interface and operate within the courts of heaven, I believe that doing so will radically increase your prayer life, your relationship with God, how you view and understand the relationship between God and Satan, and so many other areas. I want to take some time to go over some highlights from an amazing book called Operating in the Courts of Heaven by Robert Henderson. Robert Henderson did an amazing job laying out the biblical foundation for the heavenly court system and how we can operate in it using the Holy Spirit. If you're interested in this topic, I highly recommend you actually read the book, but you can also watch this video to get a high-level summary of how to operate in the courts of heaven and the biblical justification that you have for doing so. Everything that happens in a courtroom is about presenting evidence, making requests, answering accusations, and it's a legal process. And the result is that a verdict is rendered, and that verdict is going to be consistent with the petitions, the evidence, and the discovery, and the, everything that's put forward during the trial. And the ultimate end game is that justice is served. I believe we each have a role to play in the heavenly courtroom to carry out decrees and remove spiritual roadblocks. We know that God has seated us with him in heavenly places. And that's where the heavenly courtroom is. That's where the heavenly courtroom is. That's where the heavenly courtroom is. So it's important to realize that prayer is actually an activity that takes place in the courtroom of heaven. It's a petition. And there's a protocol in the natural courtroom and in the same way there's a protocol in the heavenly courtroom. So I want to dig into the heavenly court system, the protocols, the evidence that we see in the Bible. And I'm going to start with this incredible verse in Hebrews. Paul says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Bible tells us that heaven is open for the child of God to come and find mercy and grace in the time of need. This is an invitation to step into the courtroom. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. With justice he judges and wages war. Now notice that first he judges, then he makes war. And this is a courtroom activity. Justice flows out from the courtroom as a result of this judgment. So if we get legal renderings concerning a situation, then we can march onto the battlefield and win. First he judges, then he makes war. The problem is that oftentimes we march onto the battlefield without legal verdicts from heaven backing us up. We need to march into the courtroom before we march onto the battlefield. March into the courtroom before we march onto the battle. Before we march onto the battle.
One of the major themes is this idea that God is Father, Friend, and Judge. Now we know God is the Father. Jesus teaches us to pray our Father who art in heaven. And we know God is a friend. And John, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. So God is the Father, God is the friend. And God is also the judge. The judge. The judge. And I want to look at Luke 18. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? If this widow could get an answer from an unjust judge through her persistent activity in court, how much more shall we gain an answer as the elect of God before the righteous judge of all the earth? Jesus spoke this parable so that people would not give up on prayer, yes, but he also spoke this parable to unlock a secret that prayer is an activity in the courtroom of heaven. It's an activity in the courtroom of heaven. When the widow wanted justice from her adversary, she went to the judge in the courtroom, not to the battlefield. She didn't need to march onto the battlefield and yell at her adversary. She needed a verdict from the court. She didn't even have to address her adversary or speak to him. She went right to the court, spoke only to the judge, and the judge was the one who granted her the request, and she received the verdict for her need. She understood something super important, which is that if the judge gives a verdict, the adversary would be destroyed and she would win. It doesn't matter what she does directly toward the adversary. All she had to do was go to the judge. All she had to do was go to the judge. All she had to do was go to the judge. Revelation 12.10 says that the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So we know that Satan is the accuser, and we know that he can be overcome by the blood of Jesus and the testimony of those who believe. Satan builds a case against us and charges us with crimes to deny us our destiny. And in order to be victorious against the devil, we must understand that there is a legal dimension to the spiritual realm legal dimension to the spiritual realm. realm. Unlocking this legal dimension in your mind, in your spirit, and accessing into the courts of heaven is going to be tremendous in breaking free from bondage, from generational curses, from strongholds. All of these things have legal precedent. One of the main ways that we give Satan legal rights to oppress us is through something called iniquity, which is a habitual mistake or sin. When we make a pattern of stepping outside of God's blueprint for our lives and disobeying him, we give way to iniquity. Now, iniquity will do four things. Iniquity will grant the legal right for Satan to tempt us in a given area. So when multiple generations repeat the same sin, this gives Satan the legal right to tempt the next generation with the same sins that their fathers fell prey to. And when this curse is broken, we can still be tempted 
but we now have the strength and ability to say no to that temptation. So number two, it will fashion our identity. Iniquity will create a false identity for us. Our identity is our innermost thoughts and what we think about ourselves. And when we have a proper identity, we believe the things that God believes about us. And we trust in who he says that we are. Um, but iniquity distorts our beliefs and we start believing things about ourselves that aren't true and that are different from what God believes. I'm an addict, I'm broke, I'll never be good enough for my spouse, I'll never be good enough for my parents. So when iniquity is dealt with in the courts of heaven and curses are broken, we can finally hear the Lord in a new way and feel his passion. We also no longer see ourselves as unworthy and we are free to walk as God created us in the fullness of our Christed identity. Number three, iniquity warps our destiny. God's original intent for us, which is written in the books of heaven, is no longer what determines our destiny because Satan will now use generational patterns, temptations, curses, all of these things to distract, delay, and impede us from walking in our God-intended destiny. We know that God's heart for us is that we seek what our purpose is and work with Him to have our purpose revealed and enacted on earth. Curses are able to be used by Satan when there is iniquity to take us away from our God-intended purpose, to distract us, to delay God's purpose to delay your assignment. And number four, iniquity gives the devil a legal right to build a case against us that results in generational curses. So these generational curses come when Satan has presented a legal case against us in the spiritual realm. These curses can even exist against entire cities, entire peoples, and entire nations. The Old Testament contains many examples of curses over entire cities and nations due to generational iniquity. And these curses are always dealt with by entering into the courts of heaven. Now that we understand the basics of the courtroom, the accuser, iniquity, the curses, and all of this foundational understanding, it's time to learn a little bit about how to actually operate within the courts of heaven. We need to remove all the legal rights that Satan has to attack us. Get to the root of the problem. What is the thing that is causing Satan to have a legal right? Let that be your dialogue with the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit, what is the root cause? What is the legal right? What is the door that is open? Because when Jesus died on the cross, all of our sins, transgressions, and iniquities were dealt with. All we need to do is apply the cross of Jesus to the accusations that Satan is levying against us. John says that if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. We can even ask for forgiveness for unknown sins, hidden things in our bloodlines, and the Holy Spirit will help reveal these to us. So the application and execution of the finished work of the cross is imperative to winning in the courts of heaven and revoking those curses. The blood of Jesus always allows God to forgive us, bless us, and speak on our behalf. But we need to humble ourselves before the living God and ask that every transgression, every sin, every iniquity be washed away by the precious blood of the Lamb taking the finished work of the cross and answering every accusation with that blood. Another thing that we need to do is investigate our bloodlines and learn what patterns of iniquity exist in our ancestral heritage. Do you know what you've inherited? Start asking questions to your grandma, your mom, your dad. You have great-grandma if they're still alive, your great-grandpa. As you search, you will find that God grants you supernatural knowledge through his Holy Spirit, so you'll learn 
and you'll see words of knowledge. You'll start to see and connect the dots in your ancestral line. You can even ask God for supernatural knowledge. He will reveal things to you in your dreams, in your visions. And this will help set you free. It will set your family free. It can set free entire cultures, entire nations, and change the destiny of an entire people. Lastly, Colossians 2.14 says, When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. So we can apply Colossians 2.14 to help cleanse our bloodlines. Use all of the knowledge that God has given you naturally and supernaturally and ask that anything known or unknown be washed, cleansed, and forgiven by the blood. Your faith in the finished work of the cross has the greatest power in the courts of heaven. So, now that we understand the biblical foundation and precedent for operating in the courts of heaven, as well as the basic way that we can interface successfully within the courts, I'm going to invite you to pray with me and let's enter the courts of heaven together. It's important that you know how to operate prophetically as we enter the courts because operating in the prophetic is an essential component of working in the courts of heaven. And one last thing, it's very important that as we enter the courts of heaven, we do so humbly with reverence and awe for the almighty power of God. He beats your heart. He gives you each breath and his cosmic law reigns supreme over all. I'm going to pray for you first, and then we're going to pray some things out loud together. Heavenly Father, I lift up the beautiful person praying with me right now. As we enter your heavenly courtroom, we pray that your Holy Spirit would provide clarity and information so that the root of any curses can be revealed and repented for in Jesus' name. Lord, may you equip your child with a powerful word of knowledge so that the legal right which Satan has over them right now can be revealed and dealt with swiftly according to your word and law. Now I want you to see that you are standing in the courts of heaven right now. See the Ancient of Days, the Almighty God sitting on the throne, and see Satan the accuser pointing at you and accusing you. And Jesus is standing by your side defending you to the Father. Now repeat after me. Lord, I come before you as God, the judge of all. Thank you that you are the ancient of days. I honor, worship, and adore you from this place. Would you allow me to present testimony and evidence that will cause decisions to be rendered and breakthroughs to come. Grant me grace that I might stand before you in the favor that has been given to me by the blood of your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are the mediator of the new covenant. Thank you that all that you have done and are doing is granting me the legal right to possess what you have died for. I agree with your testimony and intercession through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Lord, may I set evidence before the courts of heaven to see all that you sacrificed for be realized. I come into agreement with the blood of Jesus. Your blood is speaking for forgiveness and redemption. Lord, I repent on behalf of my ancestors for any and all iniquity, known and unknown. I repent and renounce any and all witchcraft, sorcery, divination, idolatry, fallen angel worship, black magic, ritual sacrifice, voodoo, santeria, root work, kundalini, crystal magic, shamanism, pagan rituals, blood covenants, blood rituals, fornication, adultery, necromancy, necrophilia, bestiality, abortion, murder, theft, bribery, slander, deception, rape, drunkenness, addiction, drug use, drug dealing, pornography, masturbation, sodomy, molestation, sex magic, animal worship, and every unclean act of iniquity that was committed by myself or my ancestors, going back to the third and fourth generations, which is currently allowing Satan to dispatch curses hexes, vexes, and spells against me. I come out of agreement with all of these ancestral crimes now. Lord, please silence the accuser in Jesus' name. And please bind the hands and mouth of every serpent and every unclean spirit using the generational iniquities as testimony against me in the courts of heaven. Lord, I ask that the blood of Jesus be sprinkled over my generations and over my life. Your word says that Jesus became accursed so that I no longer have to be. I now prophesy over myself a life free from curses and iniquity, a life of purity and purity through my offspring. I prophesy that what Satan meant for evil you will use for good and that goodness and loving kindness shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now as you stand in the courts of heaven, proclaiming your testimony, ask the Holy Spirit to show you if there's anything in particular that is allowing a curse or blocking your destiny. The Holy Spirit is now revealing something that you need to renounce and come out of agreement with in order to walk more fully with God. 
Now take this time to renounce and repent and pray as the Spirit leads you. And remember that after you come out of agreement, renounce and repent. Prophesy over yourself the opposite. Your testimony in the courts of heaven is powerful in Jesus' name. Let your words and your prophecy over your life ring throughout the courts of heaven. Speak God's truth over your life in Jesus' name. And may the courts of heaven grant you peace, deliverance, and freedom so that you can activate your divine destiny as a child of the living God.